thank you so much for your word that you've preserved for us. We thank you that we have copies in our own language that we can read what you have done, not only in the Old Testament, but even in the early church in the New Testament. And Father, we long for what you did in the early church to really be done uh, in, at Eastside Baptist Church, that we would return to the simplicity that is in Christ and that he would be preeminent and that your Holy Spirit would have great liberty to work in our hearts. So I pray, Father, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit as I communicate what you've taught me. Help me, Lord, not to be in the way, uh, to get in the way, but to be in the way as you use me and, and work in the hearts of uh, individuals here in this room and those that might listen later on uh, on Facebook. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Years ago, when we lived in Arvada, Colorado. That was where my first pastoral ministry took place. I was an associate pastor at Arvada Baptist. Um, not all of our children were born at that time. We had Josiah, Nathaniel, and Titus. Elise was not born yet. And we lived in a little house in Westminster. And we uh, had a nice little backyard, and, and our family loved playing. We, we did a lot of little fun things with our kids, and it was a treat for us to go and get uh, cookies, like Oreos or something like that, for our kids um, at the house. And so one Friday night, Crystal got uh, some Oreos, and the kids had seen it, and they wanted to have some that Friday night, and it was way too late. We did not want them to go to bed all sugared up, and so she said, wait until tomorrow, and so they went to bed. That Saturday morning, um, at closer to lunchtime, uh, Nathaniel and Josiah wanted to have some of those Oreos before lunch, and when they went in there, they opened up the, this, I think the Oreo still had the package where you could, it kind of glued together and you could unravel it and then you can seal it back up to keep everything fresh. Do you know what I mean? And anyway, uh, so Josiah and Nathaniel unwrapped that and they're like, Mom! And she's like, what happened? What happened? Are you okay? Half the Oreos are gone! And what it was is that there was only the chocolate cookie, only half of it, and all the, the other half with the little creamy side was all gone with the cookie. So it was just the little top part of the cookie that the cream was gone. And Crystal knew that Titus liked to eat Oreos that way. And so it ended up being a, a package of chocolate cookies instead of Oreos. And she said, Titus, did you eat all these? And apparently he had woken up and he had, he, he had gone to town on those Oreos before any of us had woken up and he only left the little chocolate cookies. <laughs> Josiah, I know, ah, yeah, Josiah and Nathaniel were so disappointed. I don't know about you, but uh, when I get a gift that's all maybe wrapped up and beautiful and stuff like that and you open it and it's not exactly what you expected, it can be kind of a downer. And we kind of see this a little bit in Acts chapter 5 um, in regards to a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira and how they bring a gift to God, but they portray it to be more than what it really is in order to conceal their sin. You know, we as God's people can sometimes put up a front in order to conceal our sin. Um, we, can, we can come to church and we can um, sing the hymns like we've sung this morning. And we can, everybody's looking at us and it looks like everything is just joyful in our life, but we sang that hymn and we didn't mean one word of it. Or we can pray. And we can pray prayers that we've prayed for years and uh, we are really not, we're really not pouring out our hearts before God. We're just kind of praying repetitious prayers that we prayed before because we want to appear spiritual. We can, we can be here and I'm very thankful that you're here every Sunday morning, maybe even Sunday night and Wednesday night. And we can be faithful in our attendance and, and everyone can say, man, they are faithful. But our heart can be focused not on God, but only on ourself. I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I, I struggle with being real with God. And it's a temptation, I think, for all of us 
to be hypocrites. You know what a hypocrite is? They're a liar in the simplest form, but what are they doing? They are, they are giving the impression that they're something that they're not. And that is one thing that Jesus preached against in His earthly ministry, and He called it, well, I already mentioned it, hypocrisy. And that Greek word is talking about wearing a mask. Kind of like if you've ever watched the Phantom of the Opera, have heard of the Phantom of the Opera, they sing in that masquerade, you know, and they, they masquerade themselves and you don't know that the family of the opera is actually in that dance as they're going uh, and having that party in that theater. And so anyway, it's, uh, you know, Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, they can put up a front or a facade and really not be what they really are in order to conceal their sin. And here in the history of the early church, um, there, was, there was great things going on. There wasn't any sinful event in the early church that we have uh, found yet in our preaching on Sunday night. I mean, this, the, whole, the Holy Ghost is foretold by Jesus that He's going to come, and they need to wait, and then when He comes, He's going to fill them with power, and they're going to be witnesses from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, and that's really the outline for the book of Acts. But then in chapter 2, he comes. That's exactly what he does. And, and, and the apostles and the other disciples are, are speaking languages they've never spoken before. And it's a supernatural event for that specific time in history to authenticate that Jesus Christ is risen, that they are messengers, witnesses of the resurrected Christ. And what they're preaching about him being the, resu- uh, being the resurrected Savior, the Messiah from the Old Testament, that was foretold was all correct. It was it was just to substantiate their claims and what they were saying. And then in chapter three, God uses uses Peter and John to be able to heal a man who was at the gate, one of the gates of the temple. And then the Sanhedrin, the same people who crucified Jesus, came and brought them before them and examined them and judged them. And they couldn't deny what happened. And Peter and John witnessed to them declared to them that you, you crucified Jesus and he died and, you know, God predetermined and foreordained that that would happen. But he, he is alive. He is the Messiah. And they quote Old Testament scriptures to prove it. And then, and then they're arrested and then they're released. And then the church, they pray with boldness because they threaten Peter and John, don't you dare preach in Jesus' name anymore. I mean, it, I mean, they were known as being with Jesus, even though they were un, uneducated uh, apostles. They lived out their faith in Jesus Christ, which a lot of Christians don't do. I mean, there's a lot of good things going on. Uh, the church, as you continue reading in chapter 4, and I haven't preached on this section, so I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of context here. The, the church was, had great unity. It says in chapter 4, verse 32, that they were with one heart and of one soul. What does that mean? They were united together by the Spirit of God. And that's something that is so needed in each local church. Um, They also regarded people more than material things. And so they were willing, they weren't coerced by the apostles or anybody, they volunteered to um, sell their things and liquidate some assets in order to give to the needy that were in the church because as we look at chapter 6 in the future here, there was a lot of widows there. But then also there were a lot of people that had visited because of the festival of Pentecost that were displaced and they were being discipled to be able to go to, back to their hometowns and evangelize and disciple others. And so people needed places to stay. They needed money probably for food and and other things like that. And and one example of that is Barnabas. Barnabas here, he sells, uh, he's from Cyprus, he sells some land, he gives the money and lays it at the apostles' feet, and they use that for those that were in need. It says here in Acts chapter 4 that there were none in the church that lacked need. It was great unity. There was great love. There was great power through how the Holy Spirit was working through the apostles. And it says also 
um, that there was great grace in verse 33 among them all. I don't know about you, but I want great grace from God. Great favor from God. And so they were doing everything right. Everything's going great. This is a growing church. Thousands have been saved. Then chapter 5, verse 1. Verses 1 and 2 is one sentence here. It says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and yet yeah, can be translated a property. It's probably, you know, some land. Verse 2, And kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy or um, aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Like Barnabas and Ananias wanted to, uh, he just really was impressed by Barnabas' sacrifice. Barnabas was led by the Spirit of God to give this generous sacrifice. He, he, he sold this land. He gave all the proceeds from the sale and laid it at the apostles' feet to help those that were in needy, the orphans, the widows, the displaced people. And Ananias wants to be part of that He wants the attention to be brought on him as well. He has a competitive spirit. His pride uh, was provoked. He wanted the attention as well, but his heart really wasn't sincere. His love really wasn't on Christ. He wasn't really being led by the Spirit. And so he sold property too, and... and, um, and, and, and in his situation, he chose to hold back part of that, the proceeds from the sale. And I'm going to share a little bit er, uh, later. There was nothing wrong with that. There was nothing wrong with that. But he holds back part of the proceeds from that sale, and his wife, Sapphira, knows about it. But when he comes, he apparently, uh, to the apostles, and lays it at their feet. Uh, verse 8 is very clear that if you, if you look there with me, it says, And Peter answered and said unto his wife, Sapphira, tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. Why do you ask that? Because when Ananias came, he said, we sold it for this price, and we're giving all that to you. But that's not what he really was doing. And he deceived. He said, this partial gift is what we sold the land for, but he actually sold it for a lot more. And so he was lying to the apostles, but he was being a hypocrite. He was trying to impress other people. He was living a lie, but most importantly, he was living in sin. And you know what? The Holy Spirit, he is going to expose the sin in his life here. We're talking about the Holy Spirit of God. And He's called holy for a reason. And we as believers sometimes, because the Spirit of God is, is someone that, you know, has not, you know, he, we think about Jesus and we think about God the Father because we pray in, to our Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And sometimes we can kind of forget about The Holy Spirit, but you know what? The Holy Spirit is just as holy, just as righteous, just as pure as God the Father and God the Son. He is God. And that's what this passage talks about. It's very definitive. It's very clear. And sometimes we can presume upon the holiness of God. God's Spirit. The holiness of the Spirit of God. And many people who claim to be filled with the Spirit contradict the Word of God that He actually inspired holy men of old to write. And I would say that they are glossing over the holiness of the Holy Spirit and misrepresenting Him when they contradict what He inspired these holy men to write in the Old Testament. Do you know what? We can contradict the Holy Spirit in how we live, though. And that's what I really want to focus on this morning. Are you a hypocrite? Are you pretending to be something you are not? Are you pretending to do something that you're really not doing? You can't fool the Spirit of God. He dwells inside you if you're a believer. And He uses the Word of God to really expose the thoughts and intents of your heart. He makes the Word of God alive. And it is living. 
It's living through the ministry of the Holy Spirit as He convicts us of sin and illuminates sin in our life. And so there is, a, and we're going to see here that with Ananias and Sapphira, there seems to be no remorse, no repentance. They seem to be quenching the conviction of the Holy Spirit because it's not mentioned really at all. Even when they're questioned, there is no remorse, no repentance. And what we see here is that this sin of hypocrisy is a sin unto death. I'm not saying all hypocrisy is a sin unto death, but it is here. And the Bible talks about that in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16. Where would John have witnessed a sin unto death? In this very moment, the Apostle John was there. He was there with Peter and the other apostles. And he, he, he recognized the Holy Spirit doesn't play around about sin. He exposes sin. He convicts sin. And he will even discipline sin and the life of a believer. We didn't talk about it this morning, but in 1 Corinthians 11, where we were reading a little bit later after the passage that JT read in verses 29 and 30, even some in that congregation of Corinth had been sick and even they were sleeping because they were um, abusing the table of the Lord. And so this is a real thing that happened in the early church. And I, I even though it's rare, I believe that there comes a point in a believer's life who is unrepentant and not willing to, and has no remorse that in God's infinite wisdom, and I can't judge this, only God can, and He does that here, He, he takes people out of this world because they would be a better witness with Him than in this world. But you know what? You and I need to get real with the Lord, with the Spirit of God. We need to live transparent and get real with God if we are not, if we are putting on a show or putting up a front. There is a danger in putting up a front with God. And we're going to see that in this passage. And we need to confess and forsake that sin. How did Ananias and Sapphira sin against the Spirit of God? That's what they did. And that was that sin unto death. They just... You know, you think about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. I'll just let you know what I believe. I believe when an unsaved person has said, I am not going to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior, and they do that for so long that the Lord, you know, they, they're going to die in their trespasses and sins, and it's unpardonable. But I'll tell you, as long as you have a heartbeat and you have, are taking breath, if you're a believer or you're an unbeliever, you can always get right with God through Jesus Christ. And as a believer, we need to make sure that we are not uh, sinning against the Holy Spirit, quenching Him, um, uh, uh, suppressing Him, um, lying to Him. We need to follow Him. And so if, if you look at verses 3 through 6, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, their sin was they were dishonest with the Spirit of God. Verse 3 says, But Peter said unto, uh, said, uh, unto Ananias, uh, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You can't deceive the Holy Ghost. And there's a difference. You can't deceive the Holy Ghost because he knows. But he lied or he was dishonest with the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land. While it, whilst it remained, was it not, verse 4 says, in thine own? And after it was sold, and after it was sold, was it not thine own? Was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. Now, you read with me in verse 3, he asked, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie or be dishonest to the Holy Ghost? And he, he says Holy Ghost for a reason, or Holy Spirit for a reason, because of the holiness of the Spirit of God. And so we see here a believer can be influenced by Satan himself or one of his uh, angels. But you notice that he has not been, he has not been um, possessed by Satan or one of his demons. What was going on here is that he was being led. He was being filled. Uh, Satan filled his heart with deceit. Why? Because he is a liar. He's been a liar from the beginning in Genesis 3. And so, um, then in verse 4, 
Peter asks him, why have you conceived this thing in his heart? We, we get the other side of the story. Ananias, through his own selfishness and pride, had given Satan a foothold in his heart to fill his heart with that deceit. And so here he is doing the, he is doing the will of Satan. And we see that even with Peter when he rebuked Jesus and said, you're not going to go to Jerusalem. You're not going to die. And what did he say? Get behind me, Satan. Satan can influence you. He can influence me. But you know what? We have the Holy Spirit as believers and greater is He that is in us than he that is in the world. There is no reason for us to feel like, oh no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a vulnerable you know, victim to say, no, you have the Spirit of God, but if you are not walking within the Spirit and you're walking in the flesh, you're making yourself vulnerable to uh, the, the wiles of the devil. And he's like a lion roaming to and fro, seeking whom he may devour, it says in 1 Peter chapter 5. And so you need to be on your guard. And Ananias and Sapphira, they were being dishonest with the Spirit of God. And he says, Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And so if you read verses 3 and 4, you see he, he lied unto the Holy Ghost or the Spirit. And then he says, you didn't lie unto men, you lied unto God. Because the Spirit of God is God. He's just as much God as the Son of God and God the Father. And so he's all-knowing. He knows what's in your thoughts. He knows the emotions in your heart. He knows the sins that we like to conceal and hide. And He will expose those uh, in our life. And then look at verse, verses 5 and 6. It says, And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. Ananias was shocked. He did not expect Peter to know this, but the Spirit of God had revealed to Peter the heart of Ananias, and he rebuked him, and he confronted him. Now, Peter, uh, some, some churches uh, that exist kind of give power to Peter and say, well, Peter had the power to be able to slay him. No, did you read the text in verses 5 and 6? It says that upon hearing these words, and what words were they? All he did was ask questions. He just asked, why, why have you allowed Satan to fill your heart, to lie into the Holy Ghost? Why have you conceived this thought in your heart? That's all he asked. Who took Ananias' life? The Spirit of God did. And this is really good for us, especially um, just looking at history of the church, is that there have been there's been churches like in Great Britain when the Roman Catholics were in control who would use this passage of Scripture to condone killing people who disagreed with uh, what they taught and believed. The Church of England did the same thing as well. What we see here is that, you know what, who is the one who is supposed to lead and guard our consciences and lead our hearts? It's the Holy Spirit of God, not a church. Your faith is not in a church, should not be in a church, whether it's a Baptist church or any other church. Your faith needs to be in God and what He has written down and preserved for us. Amen. And we need to be led by the Spirit. And some of those old time saints who died for the faith, they even prayed for their martyrs and they taught them and said, We are doing as God, God has uh, written in His Word and as His Spirit has led us. And we see here that the Holy Spirit does not. He, he's not a, a non-personal force. He is a person of the Godhead, just as much as Jesus Christ, our God the Father, and He does not tolerate sin in our life. And what happened when this happened? Great fear came on all those who heard about these things. Who are these people? Probably unsafe people in Jerusalem. And you know what? One thing that God was accomplishing here is He was, he was preserving the purity of, of that church there in Jerusalem. And you know what revival and a growing church really has and it's known for? is for its pure walk with the Lord. 
It's pure walk with the Lord. They don't, they don't profess one thing and practice another. They're not hypocrites. And so at the root of this, at early on in this church, uh, church's history, God in His mercy intervenes and He judges His own children because He doesn't turn a blind to His children. He disciplines them and He judges their hypocrisy. And He does it so that not only there'll be great power and great love and great unity, but there would be great purity uh, seen in His church. I think that is a need even today. As people outside of our church are looking in, they're looking for something different than what they're seeing in the world. They're looking for people who love one another even though they don't always agree. They're looking for people who are living out what they say they believe. They're looking for people who care enough about them if they really believe that they're dying and going to hell, will go and talk to them about the solution that Jesus saves. They're looking in, they're looking in from the outside, and if they don't see a difference, why would they listen to you? Why would they listen to me? And the Holy Spirit is addressing that need today as well. Are you standing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you standing in holiness, set apartness, that you are walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh, not in your selfishness? Um, verses uh, 7 through 11 really focus on the confrontation of Sapphira, and it's another sin that is confronted, and it's defiance. Not just dishonesty, but defiance to the Holy Spirit. If you look at verses 7 and 8, it says, And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Apparently it took three hours for them to bury Ananias. They did have to take him outside the city to do that. That was the practice of the Jews, the Romans, the Greeks to do that. Um, and so they come, they're coming back. And during that time, Sapphira has not heard about her husband's death. She doesn't know where he is. And, and it, it struck me in verse 8, it says, And Peter answered unto her. And I was like, answered? Did she say something? It doesn't say that in the text. So I'm like, I wonder what she said. I don't know. I'm going to speculate. I'm, I'm thinking that either she arrived because she knew her husband was going before her, or you know, she was there in Jerusalem and she went shopping somewhere. And then she, I'm just speculating, and then she comes a little bit later and expects to be part of the attention and all the glamour of giving such a you know, great and generous gift. Anyway, she shows up, and I, I think she's asked, like, where's Ananias? I was supposed to meet him here. Where is Ananias? And Peter answered, you tell me whether you sold that land for so much. He gave her an opportunity to repent. He gave her an opportunity to tell the truth. But what did she do? She perpetuated with the lie. She participated in the cover-up. And she said, yay, yes, yes, for so much. That's what we gave. And she knew because it told us earlier in the passage in verse 1, um, 1 or 2, it was uh, verse, uh, I'm re not recalling it, verse 1 or 2, that she was privy to it. And so we look at uh, verse uh, 9 and then 10 and 11. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of, God, of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thine husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. And so, what does he confront? They had, the word is, tempted the Spirit of the Lord, or tested the Spirit of the Lord. Sometimes in the Old Testament, we see that the Lord actually invites His people to test His faithfulness, or test what He has revealed in His Word, and says, ask me a sign and I'll give it, Right? And, but in this case, it's, a, it's, a little, it's different. God hasn't asked for that. And what, what they're doing, this is an evil tempting of the Lord where an Ananias and Sapphira are testing the holiness of the Spirit of God. They're saying, hey, we can cover this up. Who's going to know? Who's going to know? They didn't really have a true understanding of the Spirit of God. They didn't believe that God saw what was in their heart. And also, they didn't believe that He would do anything about it. 
So they were tempting or testing not only the holiness of the Spirit of God, but the righteousness and the justice of the Spirit of God. And that was a mistake. That was a mistake. It was defiance. It was like, you know what? I challenge you. I challenge you to do something about it. I, 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 I can do this and get away with it. And it's defiance. And that's exactly what Christians even do today. People who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, they're not only living dishonest before God's people and the Lord, but they also are living defiant to the Holy Spirit of God. And so we see the result of that, uh, them presuming upon God's uh, justice and His holiness. And it says in verses 10 and 11, it's one sentence here, "Then then fell she down straightway, at his feet, or immediately at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church this time, and as many as heard these things. And so we see here that God used, even though a terrible thing, God doesn't rejoice in disciplining his children or judging his children. He, he doesn't. And I, if you walk away from this sermon or from this message and this passage and think that, you've totally missed it. You totally missed it. The Spirit of God through Peter was giving each one of these individuals an opportunity to repent and to express remorse. But they refused to do so. Why? Because they were defiant to the Spirit of God. And God used it for good, and that great fear came upon the whole church, not just the unsaved. Because you know what? The, the church judgment, actually Peter writes a little bit later in 1 Peter, judgment must begin in the house of the Lord. How do we expect for, uh, for people to see a difference in us unless we allow God to begin examining our hearts and begin working in our hearts, and we are yielded and walking in His Spirit. Can I ask you, are you a hypocrite? Are you pretending to be something you are not? It might be that there's someone here that says, you know, everybody in this church would, if we had you come up forward, and I said, and I say, do you believe this person's a Christian or not? You know, the people in the church say, yeah, but you know in your heart you're not. I don't know if you got confused and as a young child, and you went ahead and were baptized, and, and your pride standing in the way of you just getting real with God and saying, you know what? I'm not born again. I'm not born again. I had to do that when I was 16 years old. I, I had made a profession when I was six. I had been baptized when I was six years old. But, when, but, but you know what? God, I wasn't born again because God never did... Uh, changed my life at all. And as I was looking back at that decision, that profession, professions do not, uh, cannot save a soul. A lot of times professions are to please people. And as I look back, I, I saw that, yeah, I was scared of hell, but I was just doing what my mom and dad told me to do, what, I, what my pastor told me to do so that I wouldn't be scared of hell anymore. But you know what? I didn't realize that I was a sinner. I think I thought I was still okay. I could do enough. I could do something in order to earn my way to heaven, to make things right with God. And if that's you, you're not saved. You have to trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone. And I understand where you're at if that's you this morning. You've got to swallow your pride and say, you know what, I'm not saved. I'm not born again. But I want to be saved today. And that's what I had to do at 16 years of age. You may be a believer and not walking in obedience with Him. You know, I surrendered to, to, to uh, preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was in school studying for the ministry. And I was studying in one of my Bible classes about the ordinances like the Lord's table and believer's baptism. And it was during that study that God just really convicted me and said, John, hold up. <laughs> you were saved when you were 16. You haven't really been baptized as a believer because you were not a believer when you were six years old. It was really weird, but you know what? I had to go and swallow my pride 
And I remember they had a baptismal service at Oakwood Baptist Church that, that day. And I talked to the pastor ahead of time and I said, Pastor Armstrong, I, I, I know I've been called to ministry and, I, and I've been, I, from my heart, I thought I was walking with God. But you know what? I, I haven't been baptized as a believer because I wasn't a believer when I was six years old. I want to be baptized as a believer because I'm going to be a hypocrite if I go into ministry and I'm preaching your word and I'm not, I haven't lived it out myself. And you know, I had to swallow my pride. And I remember when I walked out into the baptistry, people were going, huh? <laughs> you know, and I was like, and, and pastor's like, yes, John has not been baptized as a believer, but he wants to because God has called him to be a pastor and he wants to make sure that he's walking with the Lord in obedience. And so, you know, I don't know what God may be working your heart about today, but I want you to respond to the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira didn't. And you see what happens when you are defiant and you quench the Holy Spirit and you reject and don't respond to his conviction. I want you to get real with the God today. Don't be dishonest anymore. Don't be dis, uh, defiant. Let's confess our sin. Let's forsake our sin. And let's live real with the Lord. With every